Oh, hello, everybody. We'll just wait um, a few few um, seconds or so for to allow people to join the, the webinar. Okay, we'll, we'll get started. So what, what's the meaning behind adopting a human rights-based approach? It was recognized by Kofi Annan as early as 1997 when he advocated for its implementation across the UN system. It means incorporating human rights and principles into any and every aspect of a working project. It goes beyond focusing on outcomes and draws attention to the entire process, implementing human rights principles in every step of project design, planning and operations. By applying this method, the result will have a positive effect in strengthening human rights and contribute to a sustainable outcome. In today's webinar, we're celebrating the launch of our first publication that sets out a practical guide for using an HRBA in water and sanitation programs, incorporating elements of the human rights to water and sanitation, along with transversal principles of the HRBA. The webinar will be structured as follows. After an introduction from the president of Human Rights to Water, we will invite female representatives from community water programs in Panama and Tunisia, provided by the International Labour Organization. These case studies are highlighted in the publication, and the common denominator is that these women have been included in a technical role. We will explore how these programs have succeeded to enlist women in roles that are more typically in the male domain and understand firsthand about their experiences in community engagement and what they, what they think made their program successful. Following that, we, will have, we have invited expert speakers from the um, Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, WaterAid and the World Bank to share global diagnostics and methods and their own views on the inclusion of a human rights-based approach. So for our introductory presentation, I would now like to introduce the president of Human Rights to Water, Desigan Naidu. He's the CEO of the Water Research Commission and one of the founding commissioners of the South African Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission. Please welcome Des. Thank you very much, Amanda. And good afternoon to everybody. And it's wonderful that we have so many people in this webinar. And this is indeed for Human Right to Water, a very important occasion indeed, and I'll explain a little shortly. As a point of introduction, you know, we have been in the last two years in an almost amazing part of our history. I know it's been dominated and covered very thickly with the blanket of the pandemic and the difficulties associated with the pandemic. And it's gonna take us a long while before we can move ourselves out of that frame but there have been significant movements in this period as well. The first is uh, that I'd like to point out is what uh, Antonio Guterres pointed out as the real pandemic that we have to deal with on a much longer time scale than the COVID and that is the crisis of inequality in the world. And you will have seen since he made this announcement in July last year that there have been several movements and discussions in several fora around engaging exactly this. And the ultimate point that it wants to reach is the realization of human rights across the board in all countries in the world. And of course, included in that is the human right to water and sanitation. We've just been through a very eventful first quarter of 2021, almost unprecedented and truly very encouraging because what we have seen uh, is, if you like, the beginnings of a spring of hope after a very difficult winter of discontent where we had the Climate Action Summit, followed very closely by the World Economic Forum. We then in April have seen the spring meetings of the World Bank and the IMF, all oriented to a very different way of looking at the global economy going forward, dealing with the issues of inequality, emphasizing the issues of universal access to basic services, and underlying all of that, of course, is the human rights based approach to all of the sectors associated with the SDGs. And the thing that we have to hold in mind is that 2021 looks like a year of pledges. It looked like a year of important political statements. It looks like a year of great promises. 
Now, there have been promises before, of course, phenomenal promises. One just has to go back to the Kyoto Protocol to be reminded. One of the things that we have to do collectively as a community of practice is organized to empower the people that make the pledges and keep those pledges honest. And the way we really need to do this is actually empowering civil society on how to ask for what it needs and how to very practically go about a civil society-based, a citizen-based monitoring and evaluation of whether or not we are in fact on the right pathways around the things that we are pledging ourselves to do. So today, and the launch of this important publication by the Human Right to Water around the human right based approach and a practical guide through programming is a huge contribution to this. This is the real empowerment that we want to see. And this hopefully will organize for our partners who are making those pledges, those political statements, those gestures that are truly important that will happen throughout this year, through all of the COPs and all of the meetings, we must organize for ourselves to be in a much better place to realization of the SDGs and a more equal world going into the future. We are very grateful to have such phenomenal experts that are gonna join us today. And congratulations again to the Human Rights Award the team on what you've achieved already. Amanda, I hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Des. And um, I'm going to just go back to the slides and um, for some reason, it's not changing. Um, so I should have showed these slides earlier. <laughs> I'm now going to give you, um, a, a, before we leap into the case studies, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction to the human rights-based approach as presented in the publication that uh, we're launching today. It recognizes the common understanding and furthers the human rights through all steps of programming and emphasis is made on ensuring action to support the marginalized and vulnerable. The cross-cutting principles of the, the human rights-based approach are listed on the right-hand side of the screen, non-discrimination and participation and so on. And at its heart, the, the human rights-based approach aspires to support the capacities of rights holders to claim their rights and duty bearers to fulfill their human rights obligations. It's very important for water and sanitation projects as the traditional approach looks at quantity and quality and often misses the criteria for accessibility, particularly for people at a disadvantage, or acceptability, preserving dignity for women and girls, and affordability, ensuring that pricing allows for all people to afford safely managed water and sanitation. The four stages that are outlined in the manual cover situation analysis, um, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation. Objectives should be planned based on a causal analysis and mapping of stakeholders, align, aligning goals with human rights protection mechanisms. The human rights principles are integrated throughout, the non-discrimination, non meaningful participation and inclusion, and with the goal of guaranteeing accountability, transparency and sustainability. Monitoring of human rights sensitive indicators enables tracking of the indicators that are aligned with human rights standards. It differs from performance indicators as it tracks the methodologies for implementation and operationalization to support SDG 6 and has outcomes that are concerned with the ways that services are provided and to whom. The benefits of an HRBA are mostly to create sustainability in all its forms. We move from a charity approach to a needs-based approach, as per international law. The individual becomes the active agent at the centre. It addresses inequalities by engagement with people and communities, building political commitment, social mobilisation, and thereby attracting international aid. All the rights are interlinked, and the provision of clean drinking water clearly supports the other rights to health, sufficient food, relief of poverty, a healthy environment, and so on. If we wish to support the sustainable development goals, it's not unreasonable to consider that we won't get there without the integration of the human rights-based approach into all our development programming. From here, we move to the first session. Looking at the human rights-based approach in practice, we're fortunate to include two of the ILO 
case studies from our publication as examples of local projects that have incorporated a human rights-based approach. Our guests will be two women, an indigenous leader from the Nagabe people of Panorama, sorry, Panama, and the leader of an agricultural community project in Kesra, Tunisia. Maria Teresa Gutierrez from ILO will also be joining us for the questions, and Imanol Aguilera, a, research, a researcher from um, our legal researcher from Human Rights to Water, will introduce the projects and conduct the interviews. I'd like I could please hand over the floor to Imanol to um, moderate the next session. Thank you, Amanda, for your introduction, and hello and thanks to all the panelists joining us today and to all the viewers that are watching us online. As Amanda mentioned, this session of the webinar aims to demonstrate the ways in which adopting a human rights-based approach to development programming can have and has had beneficial and sustainable impacts on relevant local communities. I will give a brief introduction to two case studies, one in Panama and one in Tunisia, in which projects were carried out in ways which are compatible with the human rights-based approach. I will then hand over the floor to Freddy Camarena and Saeed Azwawi, respectively, two community leaders which have been essential in the implementation of development programs in their communities. And I will ask them questions about their experiences. So without further ado, let's introduce the first case study. This first project is a community empowered joint UN agency planning program in Panama, which prioritized the needs of marginalized groups in the country and which resulted in continuous and equitable access to safe drinking water and sanitation facilities for nearly 6,000 people in nine indigenous communities. This employment intensive investment program is a perfect illustration of how important it is to engage with the affected communities in all project stages, adopting a human rights lens throughout the whole process. Indeed, when we look one of at one of the tools which was used by the ILO in the planning stage of this project, the Integrated Rural Accessibility Planning Tool, the project team was able to determine the access needs of rural people through a participatory approach and to assist planning agencies to improve access to basic services for households. Following a process of ethnographic studies and consultations with indigenous groups, the planning process provided policy support and guidelines for implementing water and sanitation services that gave priority to the needs of the most marginalized. As a result of this program, several new facilities were built, a water quality monitoring program was launched, and four new social enterprises were created to promote women and youth entrepreneurship. We're fortunate enough to have Freda Camarena with us today, a community leader and technical assistant in the Regional Health Directorate of the Ngobe Bugle district. Freda has gained experience in the field of environmental sanitation over the years and is also an active member of the community, as illustrated by her role as a civil servant and as a primary school teacher. I will now ask Freddy to introduce herself and will then move on to ask some prepared questions in Spanish about her experience as an important actor in the Panama project. And through her answers, which will be displayed in English on screen, we will get to know more about the several benefits associated with adopting a human rights-based approach in development program. Muy buenos días, Freddy. Eh, muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros y por tomar el tiempo para contestar nuestras preguntas. Es un placer recibirla. Y, y estaremos muy atentos a sus respuestas para saber un poco más sobre su comunidad y sus, y sus experiencias. Eh, para empezar, ¿podría presentarse para nuestros oyentes, por favor? Eh, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, Freddy Camarena, desde Panamá. Eh, he ejercido eh, desde hace 20 años, 21 años ya, como técnica de saneamiento ambiental en la comarca Nove Buglé, en acciones pues, de agua y saneamiento para las comunidades. Eh... Muchas gracias, Freddy. Eh, antes de hacerle más preguntas, le voy, a, voy a traducirlas para nuestros oyentes que, de habla inglesa. Eh, entonces, I, ask, I am going to ask Freddy about the main development challenges now of her, commu uh, her community has been experiencing, uh, notably in terms of water. Entonces, Freddy, ¿podría hablarnos de los desafíos 
a los que se enfrenta la población gobe en cuanto al acceso al agua en su localidad y su comunidad? Sí, para nosotros como comarca Nueve Buglé es un desafío a, a la, al acceso al agua a pesar de que como naturaleza tenemos las aguas cercas, los ríos, las quebradas, pero tener acceso al agua, agua segura en nuestros hogares es un desafío para nosotros por la dificultad que tenemos en el acceso a las vías. Eh, como son áreas de montaña, áreas muy difíciles, aún no contamos con suficientes carreteras que puedan, donde podamos accesar con los materiales para realizar las obras de acueductos para llevar agua segura a las viviendas. Eh, otro de los desafíos pues tenemos que es el acompañamiento continuo por parte de las entidades públicas a las comunidades en, el, en todo el proceso o durante todo el proceso eh, porque requerimos como población eh, que es la más vulnerable eh, requerimos de que se le dé un proceso continuo en el acompañamiento para salir y sacar los proyectos adelante y que la población se pueda empoderar. Eh, otro de los desafíos es el recurso económico para desarrollar programas de agua con sostenibilidad en la vigilancia de los proyectos. Esos son parte de, parte de los desafíos pues, que tenemos nosotros como región de salud o como, como comunidad nueve. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias por esa información. Um, let's now move to the topic of participation and to the extent in which the affected groups were involved throughout the project. Entonces, Freddy, ahora vamos a hablar un poco de, de la participación ¿no? de la comunidad y en qué medida participó y se le involucró, involucró al pueblo para encontrar una solución a estos problemas. Bueno, más que una participación en los programas ha sido un compromiso como nosotros con las comunidades para que ellas puedan empoderarse de, 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 de lo poco que podemos conseguir para desarrollar un proyecto de acueducto, de agua segura y de saneamiento en las comunidades. Eh, como, pro, como funcionaria, pues nuestro propósito es lograr que todas las familias tengan el acceso al agua a, y poder disminuir los riesgos de enfermedades de origen hídrico en nuestra población, ya que esa es una de las primeras enfermedades a las que nos exponemos nosotros como población, pues eh, a, es por la necesidad de agua que tenemos, eh, de, de agua segura, porque como le explicaba al inicio, pues nosotros sí podemos tener agua en los ríos, en las quebradas, pero no es agua segura para el consumo. Entonces, en gran medida, pues, eh, hemos sido parte de la solución de la búsqueda de las respuestas a la problemática del agua en cada una de las comunidades nuestras. Entiendo, muchas gracias. Um, I will now ask Freddy about the long-term impact of involving the project beneficiaries for finding sustainable solutions. Entonces, Freddy, bueno, como usted dijo, eh, fueron parte de la solución, ¿no? Ustedes, y piensa que la participación <laughs> de la comunidad resulta en soluciones más sostenibles, es decir, siguen funcionando esas soluciones. Correcto, porque las comunidades cuando nosotros le, la, las tomamos en cuenta y las empoderamos de lo importante que son ellas para la sostenibilidad de los sistemas, pues ellas, eh, las como comunidades, es importante la participación de ellos, sobre todo la participación de la mujer, la participación de los jóvenes y los niños, porque nosotros tenemos eh, experiencia en diversos programas, programas donde las empresas solamente construyen y no le dan participación a la comunidad pero programas donde la comunidad pues, se empodera de sus, de sus proyectos y hacen sostenibles sus pequeños proyectos. Entonces sí hemos tenido una muy buena experiencia con esto, donde las comunidades tienen que ser parte del proceso y, y, y ser parte del evento y ayudar a sostener sus programas. Claro, claro, es muy importante. Entonces eh, ahora voy a, a preguntar otra cosa. Uh, I will ask Freddy about the importance of inclusiveness and which voices could have been overheard if the project had not been so inclusive. Um, y entonces, ¿usted qué, qué, qué cree realmente que se habría perdido? ¿Qué voces no se habrían escuchado si el programa no hubiese sido tan inclusivo? Eh, eh, bueno, voces que se habían perdido eh, o anteriormente eh, es la parte de la participación activa de la comunidad, la responsabilidad activa de, del pueblo, de los grupos 
de las mujeres, de las mismas juntas administradoras de acueducto, que, que eso se había perdido, igual que las autoridades en la comunidad, es decir, la, las autoridades locales, tanto tradicionales, porque nosotros como comarca pues tenemos nuestras autoridades tradicionales que son parte del proceso también. Entonces, anterior a esto, pues no se tomaba en cuenta ni a las autoridades tradicionales, ni a las autoridades locales, que son nuestros representantes, alcaldes, eh, al mismo sistema de salud también, porque las empresas llegan, construyen y se van. Pero en este proyecto, pues se involucró a todo lo que tuviera que ver con las, con las partes involucradas para que todos fueran parte del proceso. Entonces, esa parte, pues, era lo que anteriormente no se tomaba en cuenta para realizar estas actividades. Muy bien, muy bien. Um, we'll now learn, um, sorry, I'll finally ask, no, not finally, but I'm going to ask about the ways in which women in the community uh, were involved in the program. Um, Freddy, ¿puedes darnos ejemplos en los que las mujeres fueron involucradas directamente en el diseño, la ejecución y el manejo del programa? Sí, eh, las mujeres fueron tomadas en la, en la participación activa en las juntas de agua, por lo menos eh, ser presidentas de la junta de agua y ser tesoreras, porque eh, generalmente en la comarca pues los que participan son los varones. Entonces el programa se enfocó exclusivamente en que las mujeres tuviéramos parte en, 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 ese, en ese programa que no fue fácil, para nosotros no es fácil sacar a las mujeres a que sean parte de un programa por las diferentes actividades que nosotras mismas ejercemos en nuestra comunidad y que, que nos han hecho creer pues, que el varón es el que dispone, es el que decide, es el que manda. Entonces las mujeres pues, fueron integradas a la parte de las juntas directivas de agua como presidentas, como tesoreras de los sistemas de acueductos eh, se les dio la toma de decisiones para que pudieran eh, participar dentro del proceso y, y decidir pues si estaban de acuerdo o no estaban de acuerdo en los procesos que se estaban realizando de igual forma en, en la participación en el proceso de, de desarrollo de las, de las unidades sanitarias donde ellas se convirtieron en, en parte de, de, de ser esas eh, mujeres de dar directrices o, o de construir los diseños o, o participar dentro de cuánto vamos a gastar en materiales, en, en ese diseño, eh, qué es lo que nos hace falta. Eh, mujeres tomadoras de decisiones, o sea, que, que esas fueron parte de los ejemplos que tuvimos nosotras eh, con las mujeres lideresas de nuestras comunidades en la toma de decisiones para los programas, para el proyecto. Muchas gracias. Um, and finally, uh, I would ask Freddy about what are the main elements that should be kept in mind by development and human rights practitioners in future programs in order to find long lasting solutions. Eh, bueno, Freddy, llegamos al final ¿no? de esta entrevista y te quería preguntar eh, que con respecto a los posibles futuros programas que haya con pueblos indígenas, ¿cuáles serían los elementos más importantes a integrar? para asegurarse de que las soluciones sean viables a largo plazo y de que respeten el medio ambiente y de que provean acceso universal ¿no? para todos. Claro. Eh, bueno, para, con respecto a esto, pues seguir tomando en cuenta la participación comunitaria, la participación de la mujer como tal, la, la participación de los jóvenes, el compromiso o el acompañamiento continuo de las instituciones públicas que se hagan parte de los procesos eh, la participación activa de la comunidad pues para que eh, todos entendamos y que los proyectos sean explicados desde las bases hasta, hasta los que van a construir pues en, en respetar todo lo que es el medio ambiente, las leyes tradicionales que tenemos nosotros eh, eh, más que todo sería pues seguir eh, en eso, tomando la participación de la mujer, la participación continua de, de las comunidades bueno, muchísimas gracias, Freddy, por, por sus respuestas y por darnos la oportunidad de, de aprender un poco más sobre usted ¿no? y sobre los desafíos que siguen pendientes en su comunidad. Eh, ha sido muy instructivo y ha sido un honor escucharla. Muchas gracias, Freddy. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes también por la invitación eh, y siempre en mente. Muchas gracias. Gracias. 
So I'm, I, let's, move, let's now move on to another case study that we included in our manual, uh, this time in the small rural town of Kesra in Tunisia. So this ILO Employment Intensive Investment Program demonstrates how gender inclusion and the involvement of local women in the development of the project through mm -hmm. consultation and participation mm -hmm. helped in stimulating a declining economy and in creating gainful employment for the project beneficiaries. So this project included different activities and objectives, notably the planting of fig trees in the town alongside improved irrigation installations, which in turn led to more productive harvests and fruit production. Previously not an abundant product, this expansion encouraged locals to process fruit, providing a new source of income, most notably for an employed woman. Thanks to the adoption of local technology in this gender inclusive manner, the project was able to, to become sustainable and the training and livelihood support created an environment for gainful employment. Once again, the adoption of a human rights based approach through several stages of the project, first through the identification of vulnerable groups and then through their inclusion in the planning and implementation process, resulted in sustainable solutions for the problems experienced by the community. Today, we're fortunate in having Saeed Azwawi with us, the president of the Thuburnika Agricultural Development Group, who was also part of and benefited from the joint project. Saida lives in the municipality of Gala. Um, agriculture and farming has been practiced by her family for many years, and she inherited from her father's trade. As part of the ILO Employment Intensive Investment Program, which was launched in her community, Saida is a major representative of the 29 farmers which benefit from the project. Today, Kamel Bulemi is also joining us. Kamel is the national coordinator for the ILO in Tunisia. Thanks, Kamel, for being here and helping us in making this webinar possible. Thank you. Thanks. So as we did with Freddie, I am now going to ask Saida some questions about her experience okay. as a community leader. And I will ask the questions in English and Kamel will be translating them to Arabic so Saida can answer them. Okay. Uh, the, the translated answers will be displayed on screens. So no need to translate them. Uh, the viewers can read them on the screen. So mm -hmm. let's start. Um, Saida, could you please introduce yourself for our, our Arabic um, speaking audience and tell us more about your involvement in the project. She says that you are welcome and in, in her farm and she wants to welcome with you with, uh, with roses. Can you see the roses? <laughs> yes. Of her farm. Saeed Zwawi. Uh, her name is Saeed Zwawi. Uh, um, she's married and a mother five. of five children. And I work in activity of agricultural activities. One, was, one of my problems is the lake of water. There is not a lot of water, so this is not a productivity. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Kamel. Um, so my second question will then be to know what were the initial goals of uh, the project that she was part of? The, the, the aim goal is to collect the water to reach to all the farmers uh, to reach uh, uh, all the water to the farmers for 17 uh, hectares of lands of irrigated lands and to encourage local people to work in their region and to improve uh, the, their situation and to solve the main problem uh, of poverty. 
Thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you. So um, we would be interested to know uh, now about mm -hmm. Saida's role as a woman uh, in the design, implementation, and operation of the program. Mm -hmm. هل كان حب نفهم انت دورك في المشروع في 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 البدايات نتاع المشروع كيفاش بدا المشروع هذا في البدايات كيفاش كنت انت بداياتي كنت نخدم بالطرق البدائيه و شي سيد ذات ات ذا بيجينينغ شي يوز تو ورك ات ذا تراديشنال وايز اند شي هيرتيد فروم هير هور انسيترز اباوت 20 هكتارز ويز ذا Neighbors of agriculture. My father used to work this uh, job of uh, this land and agriculture activities. And I, and I, I supported him to, to develop these activities. So, Okay, I used to uh, to to do the deviation of water with uh, uh, the bags of sand through the uh, canal in Masonuri. And this canal in Masonuri, they reach about 20 farmers before the intervention of the ILO. And there are uh, also other farmers they explored with me. Uh, this uh, project, but there, there still there there was still uh, the lack of water. And what and one of my goals, this is the son of Saida. One of my goals was how to improve the situation of of my family and other farmers. Thank you very much, and hello to her son. Hello, <laughs> um, hello, hello. <laughs> so, I would like to ask Saida uh, in which ways she thinks that the participation of the community resulted in more sustainable solutions. Uh, for example, is the project still function? Is the program still functioning functioning well? Who were the main beneficiaries? قال لك كيفاش بديتوا بطريقه تشاركي احكي له على كان الورشات اللي عملناهم طريقه كيفاش بديتوا في المشروع بديتوا بطريقه تشاركي هي بتشاركي مع جاي فسري له كيفاش احكي ما يصيرش نحكي على المنظمه لا لا مش على احكي لهم بالطريقه التشاركي اللي خدمتوا بها في المشروع مش بدا المشروع We started we started the, this project by having uh, local workshops in our municipality. It's called the municipality of Gala. So we have uh, uh, workshops with local people for designing uh, developing project. Of course, the project is still functional, and we are aim to uh, add more intervenate with, with other farmers to have to increase other irrigated uh, lands. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and what's, we're, let's talk about including the community no, in the project and what she thinks could have been lost if the program hadn't been so inclusive and if the community hadn't been a, a, a crucial part in the program. <laughs> اه يعني ب... آه. يعني واحد فرد آه. يعني يخدم حتى يعني ينجم يفشل المشروع تبعته آه. هم تا هم هم وقفوا معنا ووفروا لنا مثلا خدوا معنا حكايه حتى ولو باش تبقى كي هكاك 50% يلزم اوف كورس ذا ايلو جيفز اس تريننج 
they have they give us also building capacity for the farmers the trainings on the way of how to irrigate our land to this uh, the, the 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 management of the uh, the water uh, of course we cannot uh, work alone so this project gives us the opportunity for me as a woman to participate in this project not only me but also there are four women also thanks thanks and the final question now um so regarding future programs or future projects which elements are the most critical to ensure that the solutions are viable in the long term and meeting the needs of the community can you just repeat the question please yeah sorry so re with regards to future projects or future programs uh, yes what do you think what does she think would be the most critical elements to keep in mind to ensure that the the program is viable what what are the priorities uh, in meeting the needs of uh, the community وانا حكيت لك خاطر كي يبدا موجود السد مثلا هو تورني ما كل واحد عنده وي نيد تو وي نيد تو فيرست تو كومبليت اول ذا اكتيفيتيز اوف ذيس بروجيكت اند وي اولسو نيد تو بيلدينغ كاباسيتي اوف ذيس كوبيراتيف اجريكلتشر ات از ستراكشر ويتش سعيده از ليندينغ ذيم اند اوف كورس ذا انفولفمنت اوف ذا لوكال اوتوريتي ذا مونيسيباليتي Because in Tunisia we work under this approach of decentralization, this approach, this uh, participatory approach. So we need to involve all the stakeholders of the local and regional stakeholders of this project. So guarantee, of course, the continuity of this project. Thank, thank you very much to you both, and thanks, Saida, for taking the time to answer our questions. and providing us with a better understanding of the reality on the ground. So, shukran. Thank you. Shukran. Thanks. So, this is the end of uh, session one. So, please feel free to ask questions on the chat and we will try to answer them as we go along. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ibn, all for, um, for doing very well there with the um, interviews. And I really appreciate the um, participation from the, the women um, in Panama and Tunisia, difficult from that far away. So um, I'd like to introduce the second half of our webinar looking at the global imperative to include the human rights-based approach. We've invited three experts with different perspectives dealing with the protection of human rights, the successful deliverance of wash development programs, and the factors that can improve accountability in the sector. We're welcoming uh, Rio Hadda from the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, Louisa Gosling from Water Aid, and Jonathan Grabinski from the um, World Bank, along with his colleagues Eva Clove, Clove and Christian Borgeveja. So if I could um, perhaps turn the floor over now to Rio and ask him if he would like to make some comments on um, his thoughts based on the, the presentations we've made. Thank you, Amanda. And, uh, and first of all, um, I very much welcome this uh, launch of this practical guide and this webinar to share a practical experience of HRBA. And I think this is very much needed to support the practical implementation of human rights and water sanitation after 10 years uh, since it has been, they have been officially recognized by the UN General Assembly. Um, So um, actually, I've been very much involved in this uh, discussion on human rights-based approach and, uh, and the UN reform and human rights since the 97 reform of the Kofi Annan. And I was very much uh, at the discussion when the common understanding to HRBA was developed. And, and I must say that it was not an easy discussion with UN agencies. 
back then. But since then, uh, HRBA has gained uh, a lot of momentum adopted by many NGOs, bilateral agencies, and now it's firmly established as one of the key programming principles for UN that you know, guides the, um, our common country programming framework and social economic response to, to COVID. So, um, and having said that, um, you know, uh, I've been sort of always involved at this kind of general principle level, but, and I always thought that we need to deepen the discussion on the HIVA at the sectoral level. So I'm very much uh, uh, happy to have this discussion on water and sanitation in particular. And then just reflecting on the, uh, the two uh, very interesting cases that being presented, um, both projects focus on participation, which is one of the human rights principle, and that should guide all phases of development programming and implementation. And they, um, the, the both cases uh, particularly focus on participation of women. And we can clearly see the impact of empowerment on women in terms of political leadership. Um, Fida also talked about the women being a treasure, so control of resources, and also connection with health and other issues. Tunisia project highlights the link between water and work, and livelihood, and these all um, so represent the, the notion of all human rights are indivisible and interrelated, and water is a key for the realization of all human rights. And human rights standards also guide the process of participation, and this is very important, uh, especially for indigenous people, because it's very important to respect the indigenous people's way of life culture and knowledge, and Fredley talked about inclusiveness with active participation of women and youth from the indigenous community together with uh, uh, local authorities. And, and there are ILO Convention 169 and the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, both emphasize the, the need to have respect to self-determination, self-management by indigenous people. So I think these, uh, the standards need to be borne in mind when we design development programs, participation. Another key element of HRBA that we looked at capacity and gaps of both rights holders to claim their rights, so in terms of knowledge and participation decision-making, and the duty bearers, including local authorities, to fulfill their obligations. So for example, in Panama uh, a case, Bradley identified challenges in terms of rights holders to access materials that they need, and duty bearers to put in place right policies and allocate resources for the realization of the rights. Um, Bradley also talked about compromise. Uh, I mean, in English, it, it sounds a little bit uh, negative, like uh, you know, lowest common denominator, but I think in Spanish, it actually means commitment or agreement. Um, so the, that kind of agreement with the community to find a solution to the water problem. And, and here the, the human rights to water and san sanitation standards like uh, availability, accessibility, affordability, quality helps to unpack these challenges and identify who has responsibility to do what and in turn for stakeholders to monitor and assess the progress. And this is also important to um, just leave no one behind uh, commitment and looking at who does not have access to water and why. Uh, Salida, um, from what I understood, she inherited land from her father, but we know that in, in many countries and cultures, women are not actually allowed to inherit land from the deceased husband. Um, and, and basically lose the, the livelihood. So it is cr critical to raise awareness and build capacity, share good practices like we are doing now, uh, as Salida emphasized. And again, congratulations on your excellent work. Thanks. Um, thank, thank you very much, Rio. I'm, I'm just having a quick look to see if there's any questions from the, um, from the attendees. And 
um, at the moment, um, nothing that I can ask you. So I have some, I have some questions for you. Um, so you've already asked my first one, which was how, which aspects of the HLBA are, do you see reflected in these projects? But um, which way does um, OHC, OHCHR get involved in country programs with the human rights-based approach? I understand you've got quite some activities going on there. Okay, um, so um, I mentioned about the UN common uh, strategic framework at the country level. This is called UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. So this is the main entry point for us to include um, HRBA and recommendations from human rights mechanisms into the country level programs and activities done by the UN system. So HRBA is already established as a mandatory principle that all UN system needs to apply, and we support um, the UN country teams and partner agencies in, in doing so. Um, and we have um, also been um, trying to enhance our support to the through our field offices and country teams, and we have initiated this uh, new program called Surge Initiative. And through this, uh, I give you the, like just two examples of how we are doing this in the area of water and sanitation. We've been working in Serbia uh, with governments and grassroots organizations to conduct a mapping of Roma settlements and, and collecting data on living conditions, including access to safe water sanitation um, and also drawing on the human rights mechanisms recommendations and, and guidance. And this mapping has assisted the efforts by local governments to remove the obstacles faced by Roma community. And also um, uh, informing the, the government's response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, including the longer term measures. Another example is uh, Kenya, where we uh, supported with the help of network of 24 community-based uh, social justice centers in undertaking a similar human rights assessment in informal settlements around Nairobi. Uh, we conducted uh, focus group discussions, household survey, and, and these data and evidence uh, collected uh, are so, uh, feeding into the COVID crisis uh, response and longer term um, um, development uh, strategies on water and sanitation. Thank you, thank you very much, Rio. Um, I appreciate your comments and maybe you, you can uh, join us at the end for a very brief um, summary of your thoughts again. Um, I'd like to now take this opportunity to move to, uh, to introduce Louisa uh, Gosling from WaterAid. And uh, Louise is going to show us some slides and talk about some of the approaches that WaterAid uses in, in terms of integrating the human rights based approach. Thank you, Louisa, and thank you, Ria. Thanks very much, Amanda. Can you see the slides okay? Yes, yeah. all good. Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks. I, I always feel embarrassed being introduced as an international expert because really I'm just I'm representing the work of so many colleagues and partners across WaterAid who for many years have been working on this and are working on this human rights based approach. But I'm very happy to share some some lessons here. Um, okay. So just a kind of so WaterAid is an international NGO that's focuses specifically on WASH with a focus on reaching everybody. And like many WASH water sanitation agencies started really with a focus on technological solutions to reaching people, but realized that in order to, to widen influence, they needed to add on to that, this sort of focus on policy advocacy, campaigning for this enabling environment. And then from that, also realizing that policies are made but not implemented. So we really need to uh, focus on the blockages in the, the wider system that prevent that, that implementation of good policies. But even that is not enough without this really empowerment of people 
as rights holders to be able to recognise that the wash services are rights and then to demand them from the duty bearers. So this kind of shows a little bit how we have evolved and I think many other in the water sector have, have a sort of similar uh, progression so that the ultimate aim is really on the more systemic changes needed to guarantee that services are delivered sustainably and equitably even to people living in really marginalised situations. So what does that mean? WaterAid has its own, uh, we have our, our rights-based approach uh, guide that was developed through working in many countries and, and combining the lessons from that. So we work with that means focus, focusing our work on the people who are excluded from wash services, looking at, as Rio and others have said, the capacity and the mindset and, and a sort of a being and feeling entitled to, to rights and being able to participate and claim those rights. But we also work with the government and service providers on their capacity to deliver, but also their mindset and behavior to see this as the obligation to reach people who are marginalized. And then the third area is looking at the systems. What are the, the, the policies? What are the engagement? What are the mechanisms and processes that also need to um, change or be revitalized so that we see these principles of accountability and of participation, but also really this change in power relations between the rights holders and the duty bearers uh, to work together um, towards ser having services. So what are the actual steps that uh, programs take? This is, this is taken from an example of WaterAid uh, program in Nepal, which has been um, carrying out a real rights-based program. There's a video and there's a, a blog that people can look at if they're interested to see more. The first step was this kind of institutional preparedness, this orientation for staff and partners, because many WASH sector people don't don't that's this isn't the normal way that they come at the problem but looking at a rights-based approach complemented by analysis and planning really understanding who's excluded how this participatory planning to kind of see how to develop this capacity of rights holders and duty bearers to claim and fulfill rights and understand also in that context what are the laws what are the systems what are the platforms and mechanisms for engagement and then training on rights. And, and I think in our case studies, you know, you've heard the importance of people really understanding their rights, understanding what they need to do and can do for the duty bearers and rights holders, but also for other key actors like parliamentarians, the media, the service providers, regulators, many, many um, stakeholders who are, for whom the idea of water and sanitation as human rights are really not something that is familiar or relatable. Um, a focus on accountability tools and platforms, how to use it, how to do it, how to do this engagement, how to use uh, scorecards or to engage in, in government consultation processes, and at the same time empowering people who have been used to being ignored and marginalised, what are the ways to kind of really build up that confidence, build up that ability to engage in all aspects of the programme as we've been hearing. Um, but this is also part of a wider system strengthening approach also to understand in the wider system what else is missing in terms of financing, monitoring, coordination, um, capacity development and so on. These all part of the system are really key. And then in doing this, being able to work with and partner with the relevant stakeholders um, who are, as I mentioned, some of them parliamentarians, government, but also the, the, the organisations that specialise in human rights in the country. So the human rights institutions, as we've just heard from uh, Rio and the, and the, you know, and also the organisations who represent the rights, who are skilled in these processes of empowerment, uh, women's rights organisations, disability rights organisations. So I've just I thought I'd share some of the challenges and kind of discussion points that we have in in WaterAid because this isn't you know it's not straightforward. There's still a big technological focus in the water and sanitation 
sector. So there's a lot of money that's focused on technical solutions, infrastructure, and it's much harder to get the time and money that's needed for these kind of engagement and mobilization processes. There's also widespread in, in many of the contexts where we work, uh, where people are really marginalized, there's a complete lack of sense of entitlement. People feel that they have to beg government or beg charities to for water, for sanitation. And then even if it's not good quality, even it breaks down, you have to thank them. You can't, this sense of entitlement to a good service is, is often completely absent. Um, the work of equality, non-discrimination, participation, empowerment. These are really, this is really skilled and long work. It's not straightforward. And we, and as I, it's been fantastic to have on this webinar, um, the people really involved that, you know, it's fantastic that you've got the, the, um, the people who've been involved in this on the ground because otherwise often coming in as a wash agency, we don't know how to engage with rights organizations, with women's organizations, with slum dwellers organizations, with the, um, the like the farms associations or the disabled persons organizations. So needing to have that have that partnership and, that, and the partnerships are important, but they're also a different kind of partnership for sort of wash organizations. Um, the roles and responsibilities of state communities, NGOs and agencies can get very mixed up in WASH projects. So often an outside agency is seen as the duty bearer by providing services. So that can interfere with that, that sense of, of relationship between the duty bearers who are the, the state or the uh, official um, service providers and the people and the, the the role of agencies can like water aid can come in and sort of muddle that up by by being a, seen as a provider or a donor so i think that those sort of clarity about roles and responsibilities is often difficult and then finally just this this kind of approach looks very different in different contexts it's very good to have have guides and it's very good to have examples and case studies but it really depends on understanding the power, the political economy in the situation where you are, and also just like really analyzing or understanding and doing this with the with the people, um, the the people in the communities that you're working with of, on rights and responsibilities. So that was just a kind of a, a whistle stop tour. I hope that was uh, thought provoking and re and relatable to others on the on here. There's a we have a number of resources and uh, links here to our equality, inclusion and rights framework, which sort of explores the power issues of kind of power, which are really inherent in the rights based approach. We have our guidelines on embedding a human rights based approach, a blog, which is a really nice example from Nepal. Um, Make Rights Real, which is a, co a coalition of organizations engaging with uh, local government specifically on human rights principles, and then another blog on a human rights approach in the COVID response and WASH. So uh, lots more to read and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks, Lisa. Do you, do you, would you like to close down your um, screen? Lovely. <laughs> so. Um, I really like some of the points you made in that presentation. Um, one thing you didn't touch on was the, uh, when, when you're speaking about participation, the inclusion of women, and that was clearly a big focus in the case studies that we had today. And I wonder whether, um, I mean, I, I know you will be including women and gender, but how do you, in terms of your programs, how do you ensure that that happens? So I think this is, part of that point about kind of partnering and empowering and that kind of capacity development. So uh, for example, in, you know, in Northern Ghana, we've got work with, which, which has um, working with women's groups in the communities and sort of, and developing some working from what they see as their priorities, developing maybe entrepreneurial activities, building up that kind of business leadership, engagement, participation to be able to really take part as advocates, as confident advocates in their um, in, 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 in interacting with the local authorities, but also having more confidence about wash, about hygiene, about menstrual hygiene, for example, in particular, and, you know, several sort of having businesses on, on making 
uh, reusable pads and um, and sort of soap making in Mali, you know, so there's there's lots of different opportunities, but I would say the main thing on working with women uh, empowerment is, is um, also working through those local structures um, that already exist and with that expertise, mm -hmm. but it's really important. Yeah. Um, so um, we've had, we've got several questions in the in the chat. If um, if you're prepared to answer some some things from left field, um, although I'm not sure they're completely on the human rights. I'm going to select things that are more on the human rights based um, approach. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that the questions are about technology, which is actually not what you were saying in your presentation, that the technology is almost sidetracking in terms of getting the results that you need, isn't it? You, you, um, I think your point was that we need to be concentrating on the process and how to get the community involved rather than worrying about expensive technology. Yeah, I mean, I think the technology is really important, but the technology with, if it, it, technology that's installed without the right participation, without people understanding the implications of kind of costs and so on in, in the long-term running costs will, will often break down. So that if you only focus on the technology without the engagement and without the rights-based approach, then the technology will be the sustainability of the technology is, is often compromised. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a very general question here. I don't know whether you can answer it quickly, but um, how does using a human rights-based approach allow World Trade to address the wider power imbalances, injustice and inequality and inequalities in the sector? Does it allow for redistribution? <laughs> I mean, it's very flat. I mean, if I was to focus that question a little bit more, I could, um, I think looking at the case studies that we had today, um, by involving women from the word go in the technical part of the programs, it was possible to, um, to bring those women along, to give them more education, to give them more positions of influence. And I, and I think that, that that was possibly the, the, strong, the, the strong message that came out of those. If so, you think, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Perhaps you'd like to make a comment on that. Yeah. yeah, no, I would definitely. I mean, yeah, it's 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 a part. I think the whole approach, I think you can do quite a lot in small communities and in, in quite specific projects like we've heard. But then it's it's also important to really kind of shift this this um, this understanding that water and sanitation are human rights at the kind of national level and amongst all of the stakeholders. So, you know, like that's why it's so important, I think, working with human rights institutions, having water and sanitation seen as, um, you know, and collaborating sometimes, depending on the context, of course, with civil society organizations that are working more broadly on rights. There's um, End Water Poverty, for example, has a Claim Your Water Rights um, campaign with a lot of civil society and youth organizations. So it's not, I think the human rights-based approach at the project level is one thing, and you can get this kind of sense of um, empowerment that, that sort of challenges the, 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 the status quo, which says that, you know, money and resources are directed at, at people with more power um, and, and already more, more resources at, at the lower level, but you need to work at the other at other levels as well. And that's why this kind of webinar is really important. Yeah, yeah thank you. Really helpful. I think um, we, we, it's time to move on to our next presenters, but uh, keep thinking. And if there's more that you'd like to add, perhaps you can add your comments at the end. I'd like, um, thank you, Louisa. I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Gravinsky next from, from the World Bank. Um, Jonathan is here with a few of his colleagues, um, Eva Clover and Christian Borger Borg uh, uh, They They've been working on some analysis of aspects of a human rights based approach, particularly on accountability. And I'd like to invite them to share some of their work today and maybe answer a few questions as well. So, um, Jonathan, um, if you start speaking, you should be spotlighted. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Here we can. Perfect. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for hosting us. Um, my name is Jonathan Grabinski. I'm a consultant at the World Bank. 
and one of and, and one of the co-authors of this paper. Although they are not presenting, uh, my colleagues Christian Borja, senior economist at the Water Sanitation Practice of the World Bank, and Eva Clovey, program manager, are also in the call. And all three of us will be around after the presentation to respond to any questions. So we are still in the drafting stages of this paper, but just to lay out the context, this piece of work differs somewhat from some of the other initiatives introduced in this workshop, in that it is more of a conceptual piece, which we are hoping will help contribute to the research and academic literature on a human rights-based approach to water sanitation. The title of our paper is Introducing a Framework for Analyzing Weaknesses in Institutional Service Delivery and the Human Rights to Water Sanitation. And as part of it, we look at a series of case studies in four countries. Oops, I don't think I'm able to, there we go. Um, so our research is in great part motivated by the human rights literature, which assigns the state the responsibility for safeguarding and guaranteeing the right to clean and adequate water and sanitation. This slide here includes two of the major landmark pieces of human rights literature published on the subject. Commentary 15 to the UNCESCR is probably the anchor piece on the subject as it lays out the general legal obligation of the state to respect, to protect and fulfill the right of water and sanitation. Future pieces like the 2011 United Nations General Assembly resolution reinforces the role of the state in safeguarding the access to water, water and sanitation. So given that the literature on human rights to water sanitation assigns the state the responsibility of safeguarding access to wash, in this paper, we seek to understand the channels through which failures in government service delivery may be preventing the state from guaranteeing this basic human right. We thus introduced the following analytical framework. This framework comes from a 2004 World Development Report, which was published by the World Bank, and maps out the chain of delivery and service provision as a function of three different actors. These actors include citizens and clients in the left corner, the state in the top corner, in the top uh, part of the slide, and service providers. These actors are involved in relationships of power and accountability. And service failures are a result of breakdowns in any of the accountability networks displayed here. For water and sanitation, since it's usually a public delivered service, the assumption is that the process serves, follows a long route to accountability. This involves clients as citizen influencing policymakers through their voice, as illustrated here, policymakers influencing providers through a compact association, and providers offering services to citizens and clients. The compact association is defined as a broad long term relationship of accountability connecting policymakers to organizational service providers. This is um, the voice is the avenue connecting citizens and politicians and comprises many formal and informal processes, including voting, lobbying, and access to information. The key thing to understand from the, from the analytical framework is that service deliveries are failures are a result of breakdowns when neither the voice, the voice relationship and channel of accountability between citizens and the state or the contact association between the state and service providers is disrupted. So to empirically test this framework, we brought up case studies from different service delivery background papers that were fed into the WASH Poverty Diagnostics. The WASH Poverty Diagnostics was an initiative launched by the World Bank in 2015 that went through 2017. And it sought to paint a comprehensive picture of access to WASH across the 18 countries displayed here. One of the core areas of the World Diagnostics was to produce an image of the binding constraints to improving service delivery in each country. And this is what is, what is served as a central piece of information feeding the empirical analysis of our paper. We applied our empirical approach to the following four countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, Mozambique, and Niger. We selected these countries because they share a, ser a series of commonalities. They all have low levels of access to wash services. They have high shares of the population living in rural areas, elevated levels of poverty, and perhaps more importantly, they all experience severe constraints in institutional service, service delivery. So when we apply um, this framework to these four countries, to the service delivery processes. Our findings suggest that most of the breakdowns in service provision can be linked to disruptions in the compact association, which is displayed here again, between the state and wash providers. Um, some of the key issues leading to the compact association and breakdown include overlapping agendas among different ministries, incomplete and proper decentralization processes, and bottlenecks in the distribution and assignation of funding. I'm not gonna go into the details of, uh, of what we found in each case studies, but um, because of, I'm cognizant of the time, but maybe after in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, 
Now, let me just add a, a, a quick note here that it's not, our case study suggests that most of the disruptions are connected to the compact, uh, disruption to the compact association. This does not mean that the voice doesn't matter. It just did not come up in our case studies in particular. So um, this slide, as we all know, represents the minimum standards of services and the cross-cutting human rights principles of a human rights-based approach. Um, and using this, what we recommend moving forward is our first series of recommendations suggest that countries promote these cross-cutting principles for a human rights-based approach, including equality and discrimination, participation, accountability, transparency, and sustainability. The issue of participation, for example, maps onto our frameworks we introduced here because it highlights the importance of voice in ensuring state accountability. In Mozambique, for example, rural areas face significant challenges in communication regarding invoicing processes, institutional complaints, and reading of water bills. Um, we also, perhaps the cross-cutting human rights-based approach that maps the best with the analysis we're conducted here is, the, is about setting up mechanisms to promote accountability, transparency, and sustainability. Um, this ties in nicely with some of the issues we found in our analysis and overlapping agendas and increasing robust and transparent monitoring and evaluation mechanisms and to keep different ministries in check and avoid conflicting edge wash agendas and help better streamline funding. We then touch on um, suggestions across across uh, for improving the more generic um, general suggestions for improving service delivery. These recommendations are also informed via, via human rights based lens. So our first recommendations consist of encourage greater coordination and fair distribution of resources. This ties in with the human rights notion of equality and non-discrimination because it can help mitigate intergovernmental conflicts and thus ensure fair distribution of resources, especially to those most marginalized populations. Our second re recommendation consists of promoting decentralization and strengthening of local capacity. Decentralization can bring substantial benefits in terms of local participation, accountability, and better quality service provision to communities. This is in line with the cross-cutting human rights principles, which aim to increase voice and participation in the community and increase government accountability, transparency, and sustainability. And as mentioned in our empirical work, we've seen the issue of funding and institutional bottlenecks pop up across the four countries mentioned previously. So our recommendations suggest having a more streamlined and clear assignation of resources in the wash sector. This ties in with a human rights based approach because at its core, the principle of progressive realization points to the obligation of the state to use the maximum of available resources and to take appropriate measures toward the full realization of economic, social, and cultural rights. I'm gonna stop there because again, I think I'm already past time. Um, again, I wanna emphasize that this is more of a conceptual research oriented piece and less than an operational uh, piece, but I hope it's useful and I'm gonna stop there for now. Right. Let Eva, Leva and Christian answer any questions they may have. Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, a very speedy <laughs> presentation. Um, but the slides are going to be available on our website after this, uh, from probably tomorrow when we get the recording up and also a summary of the event. So we'll send you links to that. Um, so I, I, I guess the important thing um, that we're all thinking is um, how this impacts on um, investment and um, and I, I actually wonder about social impact investment if we can introduce more of a human rights based approach and so um, I wanted to ask either you or uh, one of your colleagues maybe Christian would like to jump in on this one um, do, do you have a systematic checklist for investments to make sure that they are human rights based for example We need um, uh, <clears throat> if I can answer that, no. But um, but this is an issue that, and hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian Borja. I, I work in the World Bank in uh, Senior Economics in the Water GP. Um, we, we don't have that um, because it's, it's an issue that um, now with the pandemic, we, we're trying to, to um, uh, reassess and, and re regroup in terms of uh, how can we leverage the investments that go in, into different sectors that most basically um, uh, are related to human rights, including water. And secondly, uh, uh, are related to, to the fulfillment of the SDGs. No? Everybody is right now focused on that agenda. And, and for instance, in many occasions, you, you call it human rights, other people call it uh, universalization of service, uh, inclusion of service or social inclusion of service. But uh, the core of, of the, the main point of this in terms of financing 
is to uh, find the right instruments no? so that governments uh, that depend um, a lot in these sources of finance to fulfill those rights and, and to meet the SDGs can actually um, uh, target these investments for those purposes. Uh, currently, uh, how, how the, um, the financing works is, is a bit um, uh, related to what the governments request, right? Uh, in terms of their needs, uh, uh, filling funding gaps, for instance, sectoral funding gaps, etc. But uh, pretty recently, we are assessing the possibility of um, uh, providing more flexibility in terms of the instruments we use, no? uh, at least from the, from the point of view of, of development banks, no? regional development banks, the World Bank, etc. And bonds is, is, is gaining traction for this purpose. Now, let me explain you a little bit uh, the idea behind this. The idea behind this is um, if you have a, a big challenge of meeting, for instance, a sector like, like water and sanitation that has this double uh, commitment of meeting a, a human rights agenda and then also um, meeting an SDG agenda, how can you maximize this funding to meet those purposes? That's a key question. No? The, the resources are scarce. Uh, the resources are, are very uh, competitive between um, low-income and middle-income countries. So we have to find those instruments that can maximize that, no? give, give that opportunity to, to access uh, finance. And um, countries are thinking with, with, with us, in, with these institutions, uh, how can we leverage from the private sector and from investors these social impact bonds no? so that not only the public sector uh, provides a, a, a source of funding, but we diversify it so that we can maximize it. Um, and, and the idea behind this is first to develop a, a governance framework no, of, of these bonds. And that's important because uh, during these presentations, we have talked a lot about uh, this, this um, a human rights framework. No? And embedding the a human rights framework uh, sectorally it's is key for for uh, developing a, a broader uh, accountability and, and and governance framework. No, how these funds are gonna be streamlined, how are they gonna be managed, and most importantly, how uh, we're gonna link the progress of fulfilling those rights and commitments of SDGs uh, in on the ground, right? And and that's very important, and that's also very complex. Because um, if we bring um, these instruments of, of investment, uh, well, investment investors are gonna are gonna put their 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 investments and looking for a reward, no? And the social impact bonds look at uh, social rewards, social outcomes. So it's very important to prepare systems uh, so that we can uh, have a, a strong framework for accountability and transparency so that uh, the governments can track exactly how the money and the investments are being put to actually advance in the progress of including more um, uh, people in accessing these, these services that are a human right. And secondly, uh, access it in a sustainable way. And, and that, that second point is super important as well because um, what we see not only uh, uh, empirically, but uh, in, in the literature is like uh, systems are, are developed, uh, people gain access, and, and then the systems break over time. No? How can we ensure that sustainability? And the issue of empowerment and, 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 um, and having a voice and accountability for these types of, of, um, of interventions is really important. No? Um, the governments are, are incentivized through these instruments to actually reach out to communities, no? to understand what are their needs and how to link uh, the outcomes from the ground into a broader framework no? that can be reported at the country level or at the sub-regional level. And those are very important elements that allow you to organize better and structure better the, the 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 finance and the investments needed in the sector. No? So this is these are a little bit the ideas and the steps that we're taking forward 
um, to actually uh, bring this agenda explicitly to the to the to the investment strategies that that country have, and how we can help them to maximize those investments. So it's not easy because this involves also um, alignment with with um, several types of um, markets, uh, capital markets, institutional in, uh, investors, but at the same time gives the opportunity to advance in a governance framework for the country, for the country, you know, mostly for, for, the, for the low income countries. And, and that's a very, very important point that, that can really help us advance this agenda of human rights in water. Uh, but that's, that's my, what, what, some of the ideas that I wanted to share with you. I don't know if, if Amanda or Eva have uh, something to say about it. Well, th thank you. Uh, that was very comprehensive. And um, I think it asks more answers. Well, it sets up more questions than answers in many respects. And perhaps Eva could um, address one of them for me um, in terms of how the human rights based approach could be integrated into projects in a systematic way um, and what, what we could do to help that. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, good, good morning and, and good afternoon and good evening to everyone who is joining and thanks again for, for hosting us. Um, so I think maybe to backtrack a little bit, just to say first that the World Bank does not have an explicit human rights policy or a human rights based approach to development like the other UN agencies. However, it can support its member countries in realizing their human rights obligations and that provides a lot of opportunities for engaging in this area. Um, I manage a trust fund in the World Bank. It's called the Human Rights Inclusion and Empowerment Umbrella. It is a knowledge and learning trust fund on human rights. It is supported by seven countries, um, including Canada, Finland, Iceland, Norway, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Germany. Um, and it's, it's been, there's been a tradition of these trust funds in the World Bank since 2008, uh, starting out with what was then called the Nordic Trust Fund. And the idea with these trust funds is to bring knowledge and learning on how you can specifically integrate human rights into bank operations and analytical work. So we do a lot of training around these issues, capacity building internally, but we also support teams uh, to help them uh, integrate human rights into the various development operations, including in the water sector. And that's how the collaboration with Christian and Jonathan came about. So in terms of systematic aspect uh, or systematic integration, we are working sort of bottom up in the trust fund in that respect. But of course, the bank has many other ways to address this as well. We have the environmental and social framework where principles such as non-discrimination, participation, transparency and accountability are very strong principles that guide uh, the World Bank on these issues. And then uh, the corporate agenda on citizen engagement is very much aligned with the human rights principle of active and meaningful participation. And we also see as, as the direct, the president, sorry, Naidu um, spoke about in the introduction that there is a lot more focus now on inequality, structural inequality, on um, inclusion uh, of marginalized groups. And it has only been heightened, I think, with the COVID pandemic. So I'm cautiously optimistic that there will be a lot more focus on this in the World Bank going forward. And we definitely see a lot of progress on the ground in different projects that we have been involved in. And because of time, I think I'll stop there, but there's lots more to say. Obviously. Yeah, thank you. I, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about this topic and it's difficult um, for people not to keep on talking because um, it is an area where there's a lot of scope for actually really doing some meaningful work and uh, in terms of moving the uh, agenda forward for, on a, in a sustainable way. I'd like to invite Maria Teresa to speak actually. She's been sitting in the background um, as a support for the ILO programs because we weren't sure how good our connectivity was going to be. And Maria Teresa was the, um, the lead on these projects. And I think having listened to everybody else's presentations as well as knowing the programs very well, that were presented earlier. Perhaps, um, Maria, you could give us uh, just your one, one to two minute summary of where you think we should go with this. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I'm happy with all the presentations. It has been very interactive and uh, learning process. 
there are some issues that in fact I would like to share with you. Uh, when we talk about human rights based approach, uh, I just wanted to bring and to, to, to that the main aims of the ILO are to promote rights at work, encourage decent employment opportunities, enhance social protection, and strengthen dialogue on work related issues. So, keeping in mind these core issues, our approaches are really very human centered. And in the case of of the projects we have presented, there are two elements that Freddy highlighted, <laughs> they were in Spanish. One is the programs integrated local authorities into the discussions of the programs. So they, they were sitting in the same, uh, in the table from the beginning. So they were part of the, of the discussions from the design to the to, to, along to the, all the process, and she said that it was not easy to involve women because of the uh, perception that men have that women have to to dedicate more time to their domestic activities. But during the program, we also highlighted that they are that water is also related to their domestic activities, and they have to manage the system. So they were integrated in the capacity building process of maintenance of the, of the system. So it gave them the opportunity to know how to manage the utilities themselves. But at the same time, as she said, they were involved in the boards of what as water operators, and they were uh, elected as treasurers, keeping in mind that as they have this uh, let's say activity as leaders in their homes, as host, household leaders, and also as presidents of the, the boards. That was one element, that's when she said it was a commitment of the community. It was discussed within the leaders, traditional leaders, why they should be engaged in this process. And this is the governance system that was referring our colleague from the World Bank. When you establish a governance system in place, it works quite well because they take care on the management of the uh, governance system, but at the same time of the infrastructure itself. So they can continue in, 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 in this process. And the, the, the third point that is the, it has been raised also is that access to, to water is a right, and they want a safe water provision. So they know that quality of water comes along with the access to, to this uh, element, basic element. Thank, thank you, Maria. What a, what a very nice summary of some of the highlights of the uh, earlier presentations. Um, we've got literally two minutes. Um, maybe I could invite, I, I did promise a little bit longer, but if, uh, <laughs> if the other panelists would like to just give a 30 seconds. Amanda, you. sorry. Yes, I wanted to highlight something on Tunisia. Okay. Yeah, on Tunisia, in the Tunisia case, I wanted to highlight that the capacity building was addressing how to give women, local women, the opportunity to improve their capacity of engage in business. And they are not only the access to the, um, in this case was the irrigation system, but they also were are able to have an enterprise of um, agribusinesses, no? So we can see that water as a right is, is, uh, is also an entrance point for economic diversification and of course economic empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, we've got 15 seconds each then. Leo, would you like to say a few words, just your main thought that we need to take away from today? Yes, thank you. So to me, what, uh, what, what we heard today on these country cases really tells us that the real change comes from people's participation, mobilization and empowerment, and, and from the you know, social and community uh, uh, mobilizations. Um, last year, the UN at the 75th uh, anniversary, UN did a big global consultations 
to listen to people's priorities. Water and sanitation came up as among the top immediately immediate priorities of people and human rights and equality as medium term uh, top priority. So in UN Water, we are starting to work to get together to further strengthen UN agencies' commitment and joint support to human rights-based approach uh, implementation. So we uh, look forward to working together with you, all of you, for the realization of these rights. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ria. Louisa, perhaps you could say something. Yeah, thanks very much, Amanda. And it's been really good to, to hear from so many different angles uh, how this is being addressed, particularly some of the kind of big framework issues shared by the colleagues from the World Bank and also from um, Rio and the, as well as these really local things. So I think getting this low, getting the whole shift in the wash and water sector to really understanding the importance of human rights based approach um, for or to achieve all of the targets on, on access is really important. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you, Louisa. And um, from the World Bank, would you like to say something each or one person? Jonathan, do you want to go? <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, um, so just in thinking about universalizing access to clean water and sanitation and meeting the, the 2030 agenda, I just think uh, circling back to our presentation, it's important to really understand processes of service delivery and disruptions in the processes of service delivery and the role of the state and the government and all of this. And we should really think about ways to uh, solidify and streamline the compact association that is the, the relationship between the state and wash providers, but also the relationship between citizens and clients and the state and how to amplify their voices and amplify their participation in order to better streamline uh, service provision. Thank you. Christian and Deepa, do you have 10 seconds? <laughs> Maybe just uh, 10 seconds on the importance of partnerships. I think that comes out very strongly through this event, but also in our work we do, we try to emphasize work, uh, working with other UN agencies and have a very strong collaboration with the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. So I think that that is key if we're going to move this agenda forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Christian, do you want to say more? Just very quickly, uh, never to forget, uh, understanding the, 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 the local experiences is, is very important, but never forget the, the big picture of this, no? The, the big challenge of, of bringing uh, services to all requires uh, that, deep, that deep knowledge uh, locally and, experience, and knowing what experiences are there, but also preparing countries um, in, 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 their, in their governance frameworks to be able to, to, to have the resources available to that massive um, uh, and, and very ambitious objective. No? Uh, the universalization of health had a similar challenge in the, in the 60s, in the 70s. Now, now it's, it, it's our turn. No? So we have to really uh, go, go uh, beyond, uh, above and beyond for, to reach this object. Okay. I, and I think that highlights um, the, the complexity of, um, of what we need to do. A human rights-based approach is not easy to apply and it requires a lot of effort and involvement of a lot of people to make it work. And it, 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 is, it isn't easy, but I think that the more we can talk about it and make it available for people to understand what they need to do, the more achievable the sustainable goals, development goals are going to be. And I really appreciate all of the inputs today on, on our thoughts on a human rights-based approach and why it's so important to integrate this into all of our programs. And um, I've really had a, it's been a real pleasure to, to listen to you all. So thank you very much. Remember it's all, all recorded um, and I'll send you links tomorrow. With, uh, with the slides and the recordings if you'd like to review or share with anyone else. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.